a November cooking class a week late, uh, thanks to the little snowy day we had last Monday. We appreciate you all coming out tonight. Um, thought that it wouldn't be too much fun to come last Monday evening, so hope you all were thinking the same thing we were. So thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we thought we had some really good ideas that we wanted to share with you, so we didn't want to skip. So uh, we're going to do Thanksgiving shortcuts. So hopefully some ideas that will help you later this week, because this week is Thanksgiving. So most of you know that my name's Rhonda. I'm one of the dietitians here at the hospital. Uh, Jared is with us again. He's going to do some demonstration. I think y'all met Lynette last month um, when I was absent. She's our dietetic intern. It's only going to be with us for about another week and a half. So we're kind of gotten used to her, so we might just have her stay a little longer. <laughs> and so also Lynetta, I believe you met her month before last or last month? Sometime. She will be with us hopefully forever. So she's one of the dietitians that joined us in August. Um, so she'll be with us today also with cooking class. So glad to see that you guys are here. Did you try some of the recipes from last month in October? Yes? The soup? Other things? Good? Repeat, will we be repeating some of those hopefully? Okay. Well hopefully you'll repeat some of these as well. So we're going to start out uh, with Thanksgiving shortcuts and it one of the first recipes Lynette is going to share with us that probably you guys have maybe done in the past. We're going to have some new ideas hopefully with that. So I'll let Lynette and Jared's going to also chime in. First, just a fun fact about Thanksgiving. Um, Abraham Lincoln, when he was president, he declared it a national holiday in 1863. So that's about 156 years that we've been celebrating Thanksgiving officially as a national holiday. All right, so our first recipe is the cranberry fluff salad. If you have any picky eaters, or I have three kids, this is going to be a great recipe for them. They're really going to like it. Um, some things to know about the cranberry. The cranberry is native, to native, is native to North America, so we don't know for sure, but most likely it probably was included in the first Thanksgiving. Um, some of the um, American cranberry recipes date back to the early 18th century. And in Massachusetts, there are cranberry vines that have been producing for over 100 years. So it really is native to America. It is Thanksgiving. It's been with us for so long. All right, so the Native Americans, they used cranberries as food and as medicine and as dyes for their clothing and their blankets. And one thing to be aware of with cranberries is that they are very tart, and so often there's a lot of sugar that is added to cranberries. And so in this recipe today, the cranberry fluff salad, um, Lindsay, who you're all familiar with, she is the one who actually came up with the reduced sugar homemade cranberry sauce, which is on this extra piece of paper that you've been given. And one of the great benefits of making your own cranberry sauce, first, is that it's going to have less sugar, but second, your house is going to smell great. Smell like Thanksgiving when you're cooking this. So, it should be really easy to make. And as Lindsay pointed out when we were talking about this, this recipe and making the homemade cranberry sauce is way faster than making a pie. It has a few more steps involved than um, normal fluff salad, but it really is worth it. Um, so, when you're comparing this reduced sugar cranberry sauce with uh, regular canned cranberries, it's going to have less sugar, has less calories, and actually has less salt. Anytime they're canning stuff, there's all the salt added. Don't think of salt being added to cranberry sauce, but there is. So in the homemade one, there's only two milligrams of sodium, which is not very much less. So some of the benefits of cranberries are that they are high in antioxidants, they're high in vitamin C, and this recipe has um, pineapple tidbits and the mandarin oranges, which are high in vitamin C as well, and that's great for our immune system, especially this time of year when everyone's getting sick trying to stay well. Um, cranberries are also high in vitamin A and vitamin K, so they're just great, healthy food for us. Um, let's see. And on this recipe, we use the uh, homemade whipped cream. And Jared is going to talk about the difference of homemade whipped cream versus using cold whipped cream. 
Has anybody ever made a salad like this, put it in the refrigerator, try to heat it a day later, and you end up with this nasty mess of water at the bottom of the pan? Yeah, okay. Did you make it with Cool Whip? Yeah, okay. Um, usually with Cool Whip, a lot of times what will happen is it's not very durable, okay? Whenever you make a, a homemade, uh, I'll get this mixer going here. If it starts spitting out at you guys in the front row, I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't say I would change anything. I said I'm sorry. Right? Um, it, it's just it's not very strong. Cool Whip, different things like that. They have a tendency to break down quite quickly when you add water and things like that to them, which you can't really do a cranberry fluff salad like this uh, without. It doesn't matter how much you drain the pineapple chunks and the mandarin oranges, you're still going to have that liquid there, right? Um, so by doing a homemade whipped topping, um, it's going to be a lot more durable because you can make it as airy or as thick as you want. Okay? You want this to be a little bit thicker than you would do for maybe the, the top of pie with. Right? For top of pie with, you want to turn that thing up real high, get a lot of air in your whipped topping. With something like this, you don't want that. You want durability. right? And so to make the whipped topping with durability, you're going to do it a little bit slower, and you're not going to have it peak quite as much. Okay? And by having that, it's going to stand up, and it's going to be able to handle that little bit of excess moisture that leaches out of those uh, fruits as it sets in the refrigerator. And like you said, you can also control exactly what you put in it, right? You can put um, a, a little bit of vanilla in it. You can add... Um, you know, chalk cocoa powder to it. Um, if you're doing some type of pie, um, there's a lot of different things you can do by by just using a heavy whipping cream um, and making your own whipped topping from there. Like I said, you can use it for for many many other different desserts. I mean, does anybody ever eat uh, pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving? <laughs> Maybe, okay, so one or two of you. Okay, um, I mean that's a great side of it. You can you can use it in this. You can use whatever's left over for the pie. Um, and you can make it as, as sweet or as, um, as healthy as you can. I'm trying to think of a good word to use for the, the opposite of sweet, but as healthy as you possibly can. Um, and it's very simple. It, it literally is just, um, we use a, a chef's approved 40%. You can use 39, 38, I think is what they usually sell at the store. 40% um, is a little bit thicker, a little bit more expensive, but the higher percentage of cream, the, the easier it is to whip and the better it is to whip. Um, and you don't have as much liquid at the end if you turn it into butter. Okay? So that's what we do. At the end of the holidays, we've bought a whole bunch of heavy whipping cream for different desserts and different things like that. And whatever's left, we throw it in a bowl and we make butter. So that way it doesn't go bad and we make butter because butter's good, right? Right. That's right. And you can have honey and cinnamon and all kinds of stuff like that. So if you have a little bit left over after the holidays, spin it past that uh, heavy whipping cream point of making the whipped topping and just make butter out of it. Add honey, makes it great. Use it on toast, no? Yes, it does. It really does make a good coffee creamer. I don't know if the dietitians would recommend that, but yeah. it still works. So. Um, it takes a little bit, like I said, it does take a while to get it to, um, to peak. It's got to get a nice amount of air in there. Um, use a whip or a whisk. Um, you don't want to use the, the hook. That really isn't going to do much for you. Um, and the best way to do it is just to get it started and then slowly turn it up a little bit higher until you can see it's starting to kind of, I call it climbing. As you're, as you're beating it, it's climbing as it gets whipped, and it doesn't just slosh. It'll stay pretty solid on the sides of the bowl, and in the center where the whip is, or the whisk is going back and forth, it starts kind of coming up and down. That usually means that you're at a good speed, it's getting a lot of circulation, a lot of movement, um, and you're not going to be too far away from having whipped up. So. The other thing I like about this recipe is that it kind of gives us a little bit of color. We think about turkey and mashed potatoes and gravy and stuffing. They're all kind of gray. This adds a little bit of color, a little bit of 
tartness and sweetness that you're not getting in any of that other items. So, kind of provides some difference. And did you guys notice the nuts in it? I didn't. I thought they were good, but well hidden. I guess I'm thinking about my kids. Anytime I can hide something like nuts, and they aren't going to notice. That's the bonus for me. It's getting there. <clears throat> You'll notice that once it goes from that that waving point you'll start to see air gaps in there as it whisk goes around it'll start pulling apart um, and you'll start noticing that it's it's actually starting to turn into whip topping and you can turn your whisk up just a little bit more huh yeah Want to keep it in an airtight container. Any other questions about this recipe? There it is. For something like this, you don't want a lot of movement when you pull the whisk out, right? You want it nice and firm, tight, um, so that it can sustain throughout the night and the next day or however long you want to keep it. So you want to make it a nice, thick whip topping. And as you can see, that's a nice, thick whip topping, right? Um, and that's, that's it. People will be impressed that you went to all this effort. Sure, you just outdid yourself. Yes. Did you add the sugar gradually or start off with the sugar? I added the sugar with the heavy cream before I whipped. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of people will add it slowly as they get to turning it. Um, I don't know. I'm not really sure what the benefits of doing it that way is. Um, I've always done it all at the same time, and I've I've made it airy and I've made it thick, and it and it turns out good. So, and this class is meant to be making your Thanksgiving cooking a lot easier, quicker. Um, so the menu ideas are geared towards. Um, you know, saving time. Um, you know, with this one, it's a it's a five or six ingredient recipe. Really simple instructions. Throw everything in a bowl. Fold in the whipped topping. Um, you can omit the um, the nuts from it. Um, you can omit just about anything from it, one or the other, um, and really not affect the recipe enough for it to to really change. Um, and then you can add different things into the recipe however you wish. So if you don't want to do the pineapple chunks and the mandarin oranges, you, and you want to do like a canned mixed fruit, um, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Questions back there? Yes. Is it possible to make whipped cream without the heavy whipped cream? Like evaporated milk or something other? I've never been able to. I don't. I don't know if there's if it's even able to do that. Simply because it's it's a high concentrated cream, um, which is usually pretty high in fat, which is good though, right? It's a powder that you can buy. Yes. Yes. How do they make that? Um, I'm not really sure what that's made from. All corn starch or something? Probably a lot of chemical. I'm not gonna lie. Probably a lot of stuff we don't want to repeat in this class. <laughs> um, I know that that when it this is the is the most natural way to make whipped cream, as far as the ingredients being pure, something that is, um, you know, I know that uh, you know fat is kind of one of those things that that is hit and miss on on people in this industry, whether they say it's good or bad or. How much you should have or how much you shouldn't um, but whenever you're like I have somebody that tried using um, oh half and half and they said well I can turn that into whip top it doesn't work so your, your water your water amount is what's really going to make the difference um, you can try it from condensed milk but I think the water amount in the condensed milk is still even too high and there's not enough fat to counter that to actually get it to um, to turn 
We'll give Jared the uh, stamp, of, dietitian stamp of approval on this quick topic. <laughs> He's been looking for that for a long time. Uh, I do agree with him that this is a more natural form of doing whip topping. If you choose to do, you know, the Cool Whip or some of the other things, they would have to have some kind of stabilizer or some kind of um, emulsifier, I think, added to it, which we kind of think now is kind of unnatural. So um, I would suggest you try this. The big thing is you just want to do a really small portion of it. That's what we encourage you to do with lots of things is maybe look at the more natural product, but do smaller amounts. Um, and then we can incorporate that in. And also, I like to think of the fact that Thanksgiving comes how often? Once a year. So we're looking at doing this at that one time. All right, any other questions about that cranberry flux style as before we go to the next? They were raw cranberries as listed in that recipe, and then they were cooked to make that sauce. And then the cooked cranberry was incorporated into the flux salad. So you would have put raw in the salad. It wouldn't be very common. Maybe <laughs> like chewing on the persimmon if you've ever had that. It's pretty tart. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, as far as preparation goes, it was very simple. Um, as you can see in the instructions, we prepared it just like that um, with the uh, garlic clove, uh, shallot. We get pretty good sized shallots, right? Um, so I quartered them just so they were a decent size. Um, put it right inside the cavity with a sprig of rosemary, a couple sprigs of thyme. Um, put it, um, I'm, I'm really funny about this, and I know some people traditionally um, most people in here would say that they probably cook their turkeys breast up, right? Most people here? No? No. So if you, for me, if you cook the turkey breast down, which like I said, traditionally isn't done, um, all of the moisture out of the dark meat, which is on the back side, is going to go down 
to the breast. So that way you end up with nice, moist chicken or turkey breast. So I did the hens the same way, put them breast side down with the inside of everything that was on it, skin on, um, butter, um, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper over the top of it, baked them in the oven. Um, they didn't take long, they broke apart very easily. Um, of course, you can leave them whole, um, or if you have a pair of kitchen shears, good thing about the Cornish hens is you can actually just shear them directly in half, right? Straight down the back, straight down the breastbone, half on each plate, right? Uh, just depending on the size. The one, honestly, the ones that we got were more like a Welsh hen. Um, they were significantly larger than a Cornish hen. Um, even though they were Cornish hens, they were, they were a lot bigger. So um, I would probably do a half for a serving um, if it was me with these birds. But as far as preparation goes, um, you really can do just about anything you want. Um, I would always tell people, always first things first, season it without salt first, okay? Um, just basically because, does, does anybody ever put butter on the back of their turkey when they cook it? Right, so some of us do. Does anybody ever put bacon across the back of their turkey when they cook it? No? Give it some extra moisture? What do you guys do with your turkey? You just throw them in a pan, put them in the oven all plain? <laughs> so, so with that, we're, we, we usually do something with the turkey that's going to be adding sodium to it, um, whether that's brining it um, or, or final preparation of seasoning. Um, there's lots of things out there, but I would always say first things you do, make sure that you're adding flavor with with thyme, garlic, different things like that. Um, you can you can grind all that stuff up into a paste um, and just pull the skin just off of the meat and and put it across the top of the back or inside the cavity as well. Um, and then as it cooks, it's just going to leak that flavor right straight through the bird. Um, and there's lots of different recipes out there. Don't, don't ever be afraid to try something new. Um, the one thing that I would say, don't deviate from cooking process, okay? Um, if you know that the size of birds you cook can get done in X amount of time, then don't change that, okay? Because what a lot of times people do is you'll find a recipe, you'll cook it that way, and then you end up it not being done or it being overdone. And a lot of that has to deal with the type of oven that you're using, okay? Um, sometimes you'll find recipes online that'll use convection oven. Um, sometimes they'll say to use conventional ovens. And if you're anything like me, when I get to that part of the recipe, I usually quit listening and I just start doing at that point. So, um, and that's important to watch for. So if it's a 12 pound bird and you usually cook 12 pound birds, no matter what the rest of the ingredients are in it, it's still gonna take about that 12 or that however long it is, two, three hours that you usually cook that bird for. Um, and same thing with the hens. Um, about an hour and a half in the oven, they bake up, they bake up really nice. Um, if you want them to be browned all the way around, um, you can put them on a sheet pan with a grate in the bottom, something that's gonna get them up. Or you may have like a roasting pan. You can put them in a roasting pan that has that part across the bottom that keeps it up off of the juices and that's gonna help brown that skin on the outside. Whether you eat that or not, that's up to you. Um, but appearance wise, it's gonna look great. It looked really great, that's what she said. And it sounds in my mind that I would think that would look awesome as well. I would like to have tasted it. Yeah. Anybody else have questions about preparation? A little bit, but it, I, I like it. I like it, it's good. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, the fat that's there, um, it's just going to add more flavor. Yeah, it's good. Try it one time. And if you don't like it, you can holler at me. So you'll have to come back to December cooking class and let us know. She will, yeah. too. <laughs> so fat has a lot of roles in our food preparation, and so it adds creaminess to foods. We found that out with this um, this whipped topping here. Um, it also adds flavor to foods, and so you often see it, you know, added to meat items um, like that butter or like the um, bacon because it's adding flavor. It's pulling some of the flavors from the meat, pulling some of the flavors from those herbs and spices. 
Um, but, you know, saturated fat for some adults, you know, can be quite concerning, especially if you have a history of heart disease. And so I do want to speak to those of you that are mindful of saturated fat. So it's that fat that comes from animal products. And so that would be butter, um, that would be our cream, it would be um, the meat products like bacon or poultry products like our Cornish hen or our turkey. And so one way to reduce saturated fats in foods is to, um, you know, be choosy about how much we eat. And Rhonda spoke to that, right? And so choose a portion size that's appropriate. You'll, you'll still get the flavor you're going for, but maybe you won't go over in that saturated fat so you can still protect your heart while enjoying good flavored foods. Another way you can be mindful is um, removing skin after it's cooked from um, poultry items. And so I believe this evening, did your um, Cornish hen come to you without the skins on? Is that right? Yeah, so you can do that. You can prepare that chicken that way at home. Um, now for the recipe that we gave you, my um, coworker and I, we wanted to give you the Cornish hen recipe, a half bird serving, because we thought most people on Thanksgiving, you're not gonna wanna spend all of your tummy space eating a whole Cornish hen, you're going to want to eat other things too, usually. And so we gave you a half serving size, but we left the skin on just so you could see that saturated fat content. I know my family, we're a southern family, grew up on a beef farm. Um, you know, we enjoyed eating those things. We can bait skin on, on our poultry, and so it's pretty common here in this area, especially if you eat fried chicken. And so if you do decide to, you know, eat, eat the skin on that bird, especially if you've got it nice and crisp, you will be getting about 14 grams of saturated fat, and that's the amount the American Heart Association says to stop at for one day for most people who need 2,000 calories. And so if you're a person who's watching your saturated fat and you really, really like eating skin, you know, that crispy skin on poultry, then maybe go a little easy on other saturated fat choices throughout your day. And so maybe, you know, choose something else to put in your coffee, or maybe be choosy about how much topping you put on. But if you're someone who could care less about that crispy skin, then take it off and put some more <laughs> topping in your, in your coffee. And so, you know, just be choosy that way. And we can still enjoy good foods and be good to our health. So I was curious, uh, do you have any idea what the fat I sure do. I brought my notes. <laughs> yeah, so if you did half a bird, meat only, um, that cuts that fat content down to about four grams. Cuts it down quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And so that'd be for half that bird. And if you were kind of picky about the amount of butter you put on, you could put less on there if you would like. Um, and you know that would cut down on that saturated fat as well. What other questions do you have? All right, our next, um, our next dish for this evening is the apple and onion stuffing muffins. And so, um, who in here does stuffing at their Thanksgiving feast? All right, who does dressing? Okay, all right, did you know that they're really kind of the same thing? <laughs> all right, so I'm going to give you a little history about the name. And so, um, so here in the United States, um, we've got a long history of using starchy foods like potatoes or rice or breads like cornmeal or um, a, a, like white bread as stuffing. We've been doing that for a very, very long time. Um, and it's a great way to, you know, use up some of that good flavor off of the meat you prepared. And so a lot of stuffings are made with some of the, you know, that, the juices from your cooked meats. It's also a great way to use um, stale bread. And so and oftentimes, if you've ever used your own crumbs, that's what you're using, is you're using some of that coarse bread. And so it's a great way to be thrifty in your kitchen and add good flavor to foods. And so here in the United States, um, stuffing was really popular um, term to use because it related to how you were doing it, right? And so you put the breadcrumbs or the potato or whatever inside the bird to cook it. And so for those of you that do prepare your stuffing that way, just know that usually it's going to increase your cooking time. So that bird's going to need to be in the oven just a little bit longer, and you'll want to make sure that it gets to a hot temp at 165. You don't want the stuffing on the inside to be raw. You don't want raw juices to be inside that stuffing. You want it well cooked. Um, but in a lot of places, we do the stuffing on the side, and it's known as dressing. And it, we kind of moved away from that term stuffing. The Victorians didn't like it. They didn't think it was very polite. <laughs> so we moved away from that and started using the term dressing. But a lot of folks, it's, we're talking about the same thing. And so this recipe, you can make it ahead. 
Um, Rhonda made it this last weekend, and she said that her stuff and muffins, they kind of are a little bit crumbly, just like you would have regular stuff in. And so perhaps instead of oiling the outside of your tin with butter, you may consider using a muffin, you know, paper cup. That might be easier to serve. These can go frozen in the fridge or in the freezer, and you can pull them out maybe earlier in the day, and they'll be ready to go for your guests. So you can prepare it, you know, several days in advance if you'd like. Again, very simple recipe. I will say um, something that's going to help um, keep your, your stuff and muffins from breaking apart and crumbling apart um, is to be sure to chop your celery up really fine. Okay? Um, I didn't. I just chopped it the way that the recipe called it. And as I was, as I was using an ice cream scoop, because our number two scoops fit our muffin size pans perfectly, um, I noticed that they were coming out in little parts and pieces and they were be separated by larger pieces of celery. So um, you may want to take the, the ribs and cut them straight down the center and then chop them really fine um, and that will probably help keep them from coming apart. I would also say to go a little bit heavier on the broth that it called. I think it says like two to three cups yeah, I would go towards that three cup, check it, see how it looks. You may want it a little bit, um, a little bit more moist. Okay, and the, and the thing is with that is is moisture can cook out, right? But after you put something in an oven, you can't put moisture back in it very easily. Now you can use things like combi ovens, which adds combination of steam and hot heat, which are great to keep moisture in. But if your muffin is super dry, when you put it in the pan, it's going to come out even more dry. So just be mindful of that. And when you're adding moisture to a, to a recipe like this, um, you're really not adding a lot of nutrients or, or you know, different things like that. So um, just be mindful of that. They'll cook out. I would probably say follow the broth to the two to three cups and add a little bit of extra water to that. Um, if, you're mind, if you're being mindful of your sodium counts and different things like that. So. And I sprayed my pans with pan spray. I didn't do butter in the pans. So. I didn't feel like it was necessary. Right. Any questions? I will add to that that this recipe, among all the recipes that we're giving to you tonight, is a little higher in sodium. And that's because we went with um, a breadcrumb product that was already seasoned. I will say that if you use your own breadcrumbs, you're going to find that that sodium content is probably a lot lower. So be mindful when you're choosing breadcrumbs to try to choose one that's 140 milligrams or less. That would be considered a low sodium option because the 250 one is quite high. Now, in contrast, if you've ever made your you know, stuffing from a box mix like Stouffer's or Stove Top, um, those recipes for one-sixth of a box, which is probably a little less than most people eat, um, they can be really high in sodium, 400 milligrams or more. And so again, we, if you wanted to be low sodium, that's 140 milligrams or less, what you would find in a box recipe of like over 400 per serving is, it, you're gonna actually do better with this recipe. So for those of you that are concerned about sodium, be mindful of that. But we kind of went middle of the road, lower sodium in our options. Um, and the stuffing mix is in the box. Mm -hmm. Is there seasoning separate, or is it in with the bread already mixed in with your bread cups? Because I was thinking if it's separate, I just won't use their seasoning. Yeah, yeah. So the breadcrumb recipe that we utilized um, when we were looking up ingredients for this recipe, it already had the seasonings in mixed it. Into the mm -hmm. But this recipe, I mean, you've got you've got pressure or you've got herbs that you can use. I don't think you need the seasoning. But it is kind of tricky finding just something plain sometimes. And so I just wanted to touch base on that. Um, Did you guys like the muffins? Love them. Yeah. Okay, there's no packet of seasoning in that. So it really doesn't need I, it. Now we yeah. have that, and that's what I used. But our, our, our seasoning packet comes separate from our breadcrumbs. And so it was just strictly breadcrumbs. Bread yes, mm -hmm. so that did not have. So that sodium amount that you just had is probably less than what this reads. Because I just left it to the poultry seasoning and bay leaf. Um, I even omitted, is there salt on that one? Yes, there is. 
Yeah, yeah. I omitted the salt to taste completely because I wanted to see what it was going to be like with the sweetness of the apples, um, the flavor from the onion, bay leaf, the poultry seasoning, just allowing that to be the seasoning guide. And I think it, it turned out really nice. What other questions do you have? Do any of you think you'll try this recipe? Yeah? It's really nice to have some of your recipes already made before the big day, especially if you're thinking about your real estate in the oven. <laughs> well, when you've got a picky family and nobody likes dressing the meat or stuffing, yeah, this is great and I could make it. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, so if you are the only one that likes stuffing, this is a great recipe yeah. because you don't have it all to waste, right? You can keep those frozen muffins and pull them out later when you want to eat them. So, all right. I think we're down to our last recipe. Let's end with dessert. They gave me the dessert because I like dessert best. So, <laughs> I tried the, the apple stuffing muffins last night, and I did have trouble getting them to kind of stay together. Uh, so I would certainly agree with Jared's comment to make sure you use at least that three cups of uh, broth and some other additional uh, liquid. Mine didn't stay together real well. My other problem I discovered was I didn't chop my apples quite as fine as I should have. So chopping those apples really fine I think would help. But I really like that apple taste, that apple flavor in there with that. I think that's a good idea. And they're in the freezer. When I used a mixture of Gala and Granny Smith for these, so we didn't have Macintosh. I didn't, I think I used, um, I don't remember. Uh, so I think you could use any kind of apple. The original recipe did recommend the Macintosh. So we're going to finish with my favorite thing, which is dessert usually. How many of you have pecan pie as a traditional Thanksgiving <laughs> dessert? Same thing at my house. It's one of my husband's favorite. So I let him try these pecan pie cookies uh, to see if that would suffice instead of a slice of pecan pie. So he did say they do taste good. Is yes, ma'am. No, he, I'm sorry. Is that why we only get a half one? Because <laughs> I made them last night. No. Because <laughs> Jared made them today, I think. So. No, he's not the baker. No. I actually make. let our I let our baking staff do that. So. So we're trying to reduce your portions again because you're cooking class tonight. So hopefully it does give you a taste of it. Um, there was a couple things that I found when I did this recipe, and I don't know, we may just actually just skip the nutritional information on it. We have it there for you. But what I found um, was that um, I think that probably the next time I make them, I'll actually reduce the butter in them. Uh, did you follow the recipe? Do you think they followed yes, the recipe they did. just exactly? Yeah. Yeah. So I found that I thought it was a little bit um, too um, slippery and buttery. It was almost too much. So I think I would probably reduce it to about um, half a cup of butter and try it and see if that worked out okay. That or add more flour to it. So you might try it just like this uh, and see how it worked. Now I did not use uh, the original recipe came from, came from Land of Lakes. I did not use their brand of butter, so maybe it is different with theirs, but I do feel like it had a little too much butter, but I did use unsalted butter in it. I uh, tried them a couple of different times, actually, um, and I do like the idea of that thumbprint in there. Um, you know, I grew up and we made thumbprint cookies at Christmas and put colored jelly in them. I really like this idea, and it gives you just enough, in my opinion, of that pecan taste, that pecan mixture was really good. And you know, if you if you have one of those, one of these pecan pie cookies at dessert, then you maybe can have another small portion of a different dessert as well. So I felt like that the way to do pecans, um, that this would be a good way. So uh, the other thing that I found was that, have you ever done thumbprint cookies? Put your thumb in there, no? So it was so sticky that if you put a little bit of flour on that thumb and then press it in, it works a little bit better, I found that. And so you can kind of move it around to make that well a little bit bigger. So uh, Jared's, well, I'll still say Jared because I think he bakes everything down there in the kitchen. But um, mine didn't uh, really retain the shape as well as his did. So uh, I'm going to work on my recipe a little bit by reducing the butter in the next time.
you might try that as well. It actually worked out just about right as far as the number of cookies. is a little shorter than I think this says. It makes about 36. I've probably got about 30, 32, I believe is what I actually got. So it's probably a little bit less. So, so um, you know, this is kind of what the whole cookie looks like. That was for you. Oh, it's for me. I had, I, I really had my limit last night. <laughs> Did you have your yes. limit today? Uh, no, I haven't had my limit today. But they are in the freezer for Thursday, <laughs> as well as my muffins are in the freezer for Thursday as well. I think it's a great idea to do the little little muffins because you're exactly right. Maybe not everybody likes stuffing or dressing, whatever you choose to call it, and then you can pull those out, you know one at a time or two or whatever, but it's, so I think that will work really well at my house as well. So, uh, pumpkin, uh, pecan pie cookies, uh, we do have about 130 calories and we do have that fat in there uh, from that butter. Um, but as I said earlier, I'm going to reduce it a little bit just because I think it may turn out. And, and this really would probably be much less in calories and fat as an entire piece of pecan pie. So that's what we would like to encourage you to do, is look at this as reducing your portions and reducing your calories, reducing the fat by doing a similar kind of thing with a, a pecan pie cookie. Say that five times real fast. What do you think? What do you think about them? It's really good. I like it. It does taste like pecan pie. What do you guys think? I thought it was a really good idea to do that. So. And I think the girls that baked it did a really great job of of making that nice shape with the pool in the center with all the, the pumpkin pie that, that or pecan a, pie goodness in it. Yeah, yeah. That is a little trick. Well made. Any questions about pecan pie cookies? So, I'm um, going to try these things maybe, maybe this week, maybe later this month. This is Thursday. It's Thursday. So you could go home and make these pecan pie cookies tonight, put them in the freezer, and they'd be ready. Make the muffins tomorrow night, and they'd be ready. And then throw those Cornish hens in on Thursday morning. I hope you enjoy some of these kind of shortcut ideas for your Thanksgiving this week. And happy Thanksgiving to all of you.